Good afternoon and welcome to the last of the Theorizing the Web talks for uh, 2020. Uh, my name is Jonathan Flowers and I have the Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Whitney Aaron Basil, and on behalf of the entire Theorizing the Web Organizing Committee, I would like to welcome you to the very last episode of Theorizing the Web Presents, All Eyes on You. Since global pandemics and in-person conferences don't really mix, Theorizing the Web Presents has been our 2020 series of talks about technology and society. All of our past episodes can be found at theorizingtheweb.org, and we hope that you'll check them out. If you happen to be watching on the afternoon of December 16th, please join us in the TTW Discord to discuss the episode in real time and submit questions for Q&A. You can find the link to the Discord in the description of this YouTube video. I always begin by thanking the production team at the Museum of the Moving Image, but seriously, we really could truly could not have pulled off an entire video lecture series without our friends at MOMI. In particular, I'd like to thank Barbara Miller, Director of Curatorial Affairs, who greenlit this whole thing and made it possible. I'd also like to thank Leonardo Santana, Media Production Manager, who has worked tirelessly, tirelessly as our live stream engineer. Thank you as well to all of my colleagues on the Theorizing the Web Organizing Committee, but especially to Tanya Lokath, who steps up to do just about everything, whether it's updating our website or keeping our Twitter promotions running. Gabi Shafson builds and updates the TTW website and has put a ton of effort into making sure that all of these episodes wind up closed captioned someday. Jeremy Antley launched TTW Presents Promotions on Twitter and designed the Q&A tiles with quotes from our episode speakers. I'd also like to thank all 21 of our presenters, as well as everyone who served as a moderator, Zach Kaiser, Dr. April Williams, Dr. Jonathan Flowers, Dr. Brittany Gill, Dr. David A. Banks, and Dr. Tonya, <laughs> Dr. Tanya Loka and me. Finally, I'd like to thank our longtime sponsor, Snap Inc., for coming along this year on our adventures in completely unexpected format changes. And whether you're watching on the afternoon of December 16th or sometime in the future, I'd like to thank you for watching. We're not sure what 2021 will bring, but we know that TTW will be there to theorize it in some format, and we really couldn't do it without our community. And with that, I will welcome back today's moderator, Dr. Jonathan Flowers. Jonathan is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at Worcester State University. His research focuses on the effective ground of experience and embodiment through American pragmatism, phenomenology, and East Asian philosophy. He also focuses on pragmatist and cross-cultural approaches to machine intelligence, consciousness, and science and technology studies broadly. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Whitney. Um, our first presenter, uh, Priya Brabkar, is from Chennai, India, and currently works as a tenant organizer in Oakland, California. Her research explores the political economy of biometric surveillance in India, with other focuses on anti-imperialism, labor struggle, film, and the politics of visual theory and design. Her talk today is called Tracing Biometric Assemblages in India's Surveillance State, Reproducing, Reproducing Colonial Logics, reifying caste purity and quelling dissent through Andhar. Hi everyone, I um, hope you can see that. Um, thank you so much for coming. Today I'm gonna to be presenting on research that I've been doing on biometric surveillance um, in the nation state of India, which has the largest biometric surveillance system in the world called Aadhaar. Um, and in this presentation, I'm gonna be using Kristen Fuchs' definition of surveillance, um, which he defines as economic and state control in order to enable capital accumulation or to organize and manage populations. So as long as our material realities are governed by capitalism and other interlocking systems of domination, um, surveillance will inherit their logic of violence and inequality. And I'm specifically influenced by Simone Brown's book, um, Dark Matters on the Surveillance of Blackness, and by Dvorsky's and Magnet's anthology, Feminist Surveillance Studies and the Critical, and also the Critical Feminist, Thalith Bahujan, Black, Indigenous, Anti-Racist, Anti-Imperialist, and Marxist Interventions that center the targeted violence of surveillance on marginalized communities. 
So um, to give an introduction to what Aadhaar is, um, Aadhaar is a 12 digit unique identity number that's issued to Indian residents through collecting their biometric data, which includes fingerprints, uh, retina scans, and facial, uh, facial scans, along with their demographic information, which includes the residents' names, address, gender, and age. So it's the biggest uh, biometric database in the world with over 1.2 billion enrollments, which is about 90% of India's population. Um, so instead of relying on the individual to identify themselves as a facet of agency and autonomy, the state has taken on the responsibility of verifying that someone is who they say they are by essentializing identity through body and biometric features. And this process requires no participation from the subject at all because it reduces recognition and identity to a perceived categorical certainty. Um, and while the propaganda um, that is associated with Aadhaar is predicated on an apolitical ideological neutral agenda, the use of biometrics, especially by an ethno-nationalist governing body like the BJP in India, is a deeply political process. And the danger of Aadhaar is also embedded in its, its expanding function creep. And a function creep is essentially when information that's used for a purpose um, is expanded beyond that original purpose. And that gives Aadhaar the ability to link every aspect of an individual's life from train tickets to mobile phone numbers to registration of schools, colleges, hospitals, marriage, and bank accounts, all forming a biometric surveillance assemblage through the Aadhaar number. And the myth of biometrics as facilitating pure and objective data collection has resulted in a technological hubris um, that doesn't account for failures of the system and the grave privacy violations along with the necropolitical consequences of that technological failure. So to put Aadhaar into a little bit of context, um, historical context, um, um, it, Aadhaar really mirrors the histories of surveillance in India. And we can see that how, it's, that how surveillance practices used by the British Raj um, mirrors the current social order of the BJP party as they use surveillance to similar ends in today's political economy through the intersecting forces of neoliberalism and ethno-nationalism. So the current surveillance state in India props up the ethno-nationalist project of Hindutva by taking influence from British colonialism. In the 1850s, Imperial Civil Service um, Officer Sir William Herschel began experimenting with fingerprints to be used for the registration of deeds and contracts in the Bengal region, and along with the verification of pensioners and carcel-related documents. And this fingerprinting came from wanting to shift to older methods of identification, such as tattooing, branding, and lashing as external proof of determining prior criminal behavior. And Galton um, thought of the idea of using fingerprints and forensic patterns to curb what they called fraudulence. And by the 19th century, fingerprinting became a really important part of the colonial enterprise um, because it, it became used as a tool to prove the authenticity of documentation and remove the potential for Indians to escape the British carceral system. And that remains the general logic of Aadhaar as we observe it today on a much more technologically advanced scale, obviously. Um, and when we move into the time of the partition um, in 1947, we see that um, Mahatma Gandhi, who is often valorized as a nonviolent and anti-colonialist hero, um, this real, th th those views and that perception of him really hides his pernicious positions on caste, race, and surveillance. He uh, writes in The Sin of Secrecy, that, which is a, a piece that he wrote, that he detests secrecy as a sin and urges his followers to avoid even thinking thoughts that, he would hide, that, the, that the person would hide from the world. And his use of secrecy as sin and cleanliness justifies surveillance measures and restrictions, um, even though today's surveillance technologies were not during his time. But the logic of surveillance can be understood within the larger system of caste supremacy and caste apartheid which associate cleanliness and purity with savarnas or dominant caste and untouchability with Dalits. And as Ambedkar writes um, in The Annihilation of Caste, the object of caste was to preserve the purity of race and the purity of blood. Um, so the concepts that are inherent to caste apartheid and Brahmanical hegemony is the binary of pollution and cleanliness. And purity is seen as the ultimate enforcer of social control and physical violence, and it penetrates every aspect of Indian society today. And according to Gandhi, if people had nothing to hide or were not engaging in sin, then they would have nothing to worry about under surveillance state. And this logic is also parroted today. Um, so a, a, a former employee of Project Insight, which is a private firm that was hired to create parts of Aadhaar, when asked if Aadhaar was an invasion of privacy, he said that, no, if you're an honest person and you have nothing to worry about. 
And this is the same logic as of Gandhi and, you know, of, you know, maintaining purity in your mind as um, Gandhi posits. And if caste is embedded within Adar, these implications of what perceived essentialism of identity coded into neutral machines or algorithms, what do they recall about historical systems of eugenics and scientific racism that are based on concept of the pure race and the impure race? Adar becomes a conduit through which the pernicious social order of caste becomes solidified through the cultivation of bio value. Um, and so next I want to talk a little bit about necropolitics because I feel like biopolitics and necropolitics are very much associated with how Adar functions. Um, scholar Jezbir Puar talks about surveillance not only as responsive and repressive, but also preemptive and productive. And with this assertion, I turn to the ways in which Adar is specifically productive, right? So enrollment in Adar is advertised as voluntary, but the material realities are fundamentally different to that assertion, given that Adar is an extremely coercive mechanism. Um, Akile Mbembe defines the term necropolitics as the relationship between the sovereignty and the power over life and death. And I argue that for those who fail to assimilate within the system of Adar, they are subjected to necropolitical control, which, is the, which can be seen by the term let live or make die. And necropolitics presents a management of life um, for the neoliberal environment of India, in which let live represents pure, represents pure abandonment. And while those enrolled under Adar are subjected to biopolitical control, those who are not subjected um, are subjected to necropolitical control as they have no access to any social welfare, um, showing the state's wielding of control over the populations of life and death. And while no, legally no one can be forced to enroll in Adar and submit their biometric data to the government, the reality on the ground is very different because the function creep of Adar keeps expanding. Um, and I, I argue that um, this, this claim that biometrics is a foolproof method of ident identification is deeply negligent of the social and economic processes of the world, right? So India is a country in which 94% of the working class population is employed doing deeply exploitative manual labor with their hands in the informal sector, which means that their fingerprint quality is very low. Um, so class really impacts the way um, biometric works, right? So this includes the story of Ambwa Kanwar, who is an 85 year old widow and who couldn't get an Aadhaar card due to the low uh, fingerprint detection issues, which resulted in her being excluded from all welfare benefits. Um, when, the, when the government considers biometrics to be irreplaceable, permanent and static features, the failure to reconcile within that system can render you an unperson and therefore subject to necropolitical control. And this um, technological failure of Adar has been reported on the most, uh, being the most impacted of those uh, being caste oppressed, working class, disabled, poor and elder Indians um, in the rural areas. For example, several visually impaired people such as Sukhni Devi are denied Adar cards on the basis of not being able to submit iris scans. Um, concerns from the trans community stress that Adar makes a person's gender essentialized as a static biometric identifier. Um, and this has also affected, you know, caste oppressed communities who are already structurally denied a dignified life by the systems of Brahmanical hegemony. In 2017, three Dalit brothers died of starvation in July in Karnataka after being denied rations of not because they didn't have an Adar card. And activists found that the ration card was deleted from the public distribution system because it wasn't linked to Aadhaar. So people are dying by, by not having an Aadhaar card. Um, and, and this forces them to submit their biometric data to an ethno-nationalist government. Um, and these fascist tendencies um, of biometric surveillance is really marked by the merging of state and corporate power. So in February of 2017, India Stack, which is the company that works to aggregate data for Ada, tweeted out a black and white photograph of a man facing a camera in a crowded street, which indicated that people's Ada information was being connected to other forms of important documentation, such as people's PAN cards or passwords. Um, and Nanda Nikolai, who is a prominent Indian billionaire and the first chairman of Aadhaar, famously said that data has become the new oil. If we can restructure data to benefit every individual and every business, then we can lead to enormous amounts of activity and economic growth. Um, and Shoshana Zuboff defines surveillance capitalism as a new economic order that claims human experience as free raw material for hidden commercial practices of extraction, prediction, and sales. 
and data, the data of people is now being mined and um, this is being uh, cast onto greater systems of facial recognition. India has announced that they are gonna create the largest facial recognition system in the world um, by contracting private tech companies. And this, you know, it mirrors the way Nazi Germany hired IBM to create punch cards to standardize identity indicators. So really the merging of state and corporate power shows how pernicious fascism is creeping up upon us and how that is an, it, um, exemplifies that. So within um, the, uh, the expanding surveillance assemblage of Adar, one of the most recent forms of surveillance is drone surveillance used by security forces in India, um, specifically um, police forces. So drones were especially present at the anti-CAA protests that began in September of 20, sorry, December of 2019. Um, and as quoted by the senior police officer of the Delhi police station, drones are used to record happenings. And in case of massive law and order situations, when things go out of hand, the recordings help to identify those who cause the situation go out of hand. And drone surveillance was also used to um, arrest Chandra Shekhar Azad, who leads the Beam Army, uh, which is an Ambedkarite Dalit organization. Um, and he was soon uh, arrested under the National Security Act after he was caught by a drone camera. So through this biometric assemblage, the use of facial recognition through a drone indicates how deeply entrenched forms of surveillance and punishment are on the basis of tracking protesters' faces, right? And it becomes clear that marginalized communities are most at risk. In the hands of Hindutva, there's a strong technological apparatus to document those they consider deviant or seditious to the nation state. And this not only enables them to punish these minorities for dissent, but it can also detect anomalies and cultivate preemption of movement and behavior. So predicting movement before it even happens. And obviously while these dangers and violence of surveillance can be rendered as overwhelming, we must turn to the overwhelming potentiality of anti-surveillance futures. So I'm really inspired by Simone Brown's conception of dark surveillance in which she describes as a way to situate the tactics employed to render oneself out of sight. Um, and, and this idea of surveillance is a really interesting concept because it means to watch from below. So for example, the way that these drones were um, captured um, was through people taking pictures of them, identifying that the make of drone that they are and then um, showing that that's illegal actually, that the police can't be using those drones. So surveillance is a really powerful concept um, of looking back at, at your looker. And um, that's, that's a really interesting anti-surveillance tactic that is important to harness. So how do we really work towards a larger praxis of abolishing surveillance? So surveillance and surveillance societies advance the neoliberal logics of competition and individualism in which our actions are predetermined by the assumption that we function through a zero sum game. And so capitalism completely breaks down our systems of trust and cultivates the notion that everyone is acting through selfishness. And as Fuchs says, um, surveillance operates with fear and threat. It's a use of psychological and structural violence um, that uh, can turn into physical violence. And it's important for us to understand that the notion, um, the notion of surveillance relies on a, in a society of domination. And we need to disrupt, um, we need to destroy those, the system of domination um, and the surveillance state through, you know, through collectivism, through socialism, to, to um, cultivate trust between us again so that the destruction of the surveillance state is imminent, you know, and we cultivate systems of solidarity and sympathy. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Our next panelist is Joseph Meyer, who recently earned his PhD from UMD in American Studies. His current work explores online hate and harassment movements and the ways discourse travels across platforms, evolves and is taken up by different groups and communities. His talk for today is The Politics of Unintention, A Decade of Showing Your Ass on the Internet. Hello, uh, and welcome to my talk on the politics of unintention, an exploration of the last decade of a collective showing of ass on the internet, and what that means for the next decade of theorizing the web. This is John Mayer, guitarist, singer, songwriter, and if you are active on Twitter in the late aughts, a pretty noticeable celebrity presence on Twitter known mainly for his acerbic comedy and commentary. 
At the beginning of February 2010, Mayer sat for an interview with Playboy magazine where he dropped the N-word in reference to a question about his hood pass with African Americans. Mayer was rightly criticized for a statement and sued apologized and quit Twitter. As 2020 follows the year of cancel culture, Mayer's departure from the social media spotlight illustrates a formative moment in the burgeoning social media sphere of the 2010s. Throughout the decade, publicly broadcast moments of racism, misogyny, and more have come to define the landscapes of discursive conflict that exist across contemporary life. In many of these instances, the perpetrators of these moments claim the controversy was unintended. The unintended nature of the very explicit forms of oppression enacted by those in power speak to what I term the politics of unintention, the prerogative of power to protect itself in the information age. As Adam Monsbach writes, the national dialogue on race remains driven by the engine of celebrity gaffes and gotcha moments. These moments lead to a quick cycle of forgiving and forgetting that continues along to the next moment of outrage. It's this cycle that I'm interested in exploring deeply as moments of broadcast privilege increase and the criticisms of these harms these moments cause are facing not only a backlash from those in power, but a weaponization of grievance via championing of unintentional outcomes to protect white supremacist heteropatriarchy and a rearticulation of a the privilege of ignorance as coined by Nicole Siegel. While I'm still in the early stages of working through what I mean by the politics of unintention, I'm beginning with Siegel's concept of the privilege of ignorance, which has stuck with me since my first time reading it a decade ago. A politics of unintention starts with this concept of ignorance that is an unarticulated prerogative of power. In all of the following examples, the offender defends their actions by apologizing for the unintended harm it causes others. Their crass jokes, counter movements, or hijacking of hashtags were not intended to harm others or silence speech, it was just a misunderstanding. Actions and defenses of trolling or joking reflect the gleeful reminders of a lack of a need to know that underpins the evolving environments of online discourse throughout the decade. While Siegel provides me with a starting point, what role does ignorance play in an information-based society? How can ignorance be deployed as a defense when we are all ostensibly connected to all human knowledge? More so, a defense of ignorance requires a good faith, a good faith argument in the sincerity of the offenders. I believe, um, that the politics of unintention require a willful ignorance in order to sustain a privilege of ignorance. So Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity is striking to me due to its context within the love and action sermon of strength to love. In this sermon, King connects the doctrine of white supremacy to a need for the United States to give moral sanction to the economically profitable system of slavery. Race is constructed to create um, Race is a construct created to sustain the human badness of slavery and maintain blindness to the morally reprehensible practice. The doctrine of white supremacy enacted throughout the decades provided white folks with a sincere ignorance towards the machinations of race and conscientious stupidity in believing in the structural forms of oppression as answers to the issue of race in the United States during the civil rights era. This is echoed in King's letter from a Birmingham jail when he decries the white moderate for asking for activists to wait. At what point does a history of oppression and violence become overwhelmingly known to allow for confrontation? Here, my shift to willful ignorance comes in. In King's sermons and letters, there is a need to communicate the history of oppression and violence that comes from the doctrine of white supremacy created as an attempt to give moral sanction to slavery. Education and needed and understanding of the sincere ignorance of others is required to gain allyship and further the cause of civil rights. But here in 2020, the collective we of those with access to information communication technologies have access to these histories of oppression and violence. This leads to a willful ignorance through the upending of the need to be uninformed to maintain an illusion of moderation through ignorance. What is playing out online and in the streets in the United States uh, is a refusal to reckon with the past pushing up against accessible networked broadcast technologies. Embodied experience pushes up against dominant hegemonic constructions of American experience and challenges the privilege enjoyed by those in power. With this understanding, I define the politics of unintention as the prerogative of power to protect itself in the information age. The politics of unintention play out through the broadcast moments of gleeful reminders of a lack of a need to know that have been colloquially termed showing your ass. There's very little definitional work on the term, but the Farlax Dictionary of Idioms defines showing your ass as to act in a rude, obnoxious, or aberrant manner, to misbehave or act foolishly, to make a scene, primarily heard in the Southern US. And it's the Southern US part that jumps out to me the most. While my exposure to the term began on Tumblr with screenshots of other not so great social media posts posted with the comment showing your ass, I'm immediately reminded of black digital culture and black Twitter in particular. I take the assumption that sewing your ass is probably a black Southern cultural expression in the vein of call out culture. So I'd like to take this moment to mention Meredith e. Clark's recent article, Drag Them, a brief etymology of so-called cancel culture, where Clark discusses the rise of cancel culture in the longer history of the call out and its place in black digital spaces. 
Clark cites Andre Brock's distributing blacknesses description of the practice of black women signifying as a critique of system systemic inequality through the call out. I'd also recommend Sarah Florini's Beyond Hashtags and Florini's 2013 piece, Tweets, 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 and Signifying, Cultural Performance on Black Twitter as additional readings around the concept of call-out culture and how I'm approaching showing your ass on the internet. So what does this look at throughout the decade? <clears throat> the early teens saw the rise of call-outs for gleeful ignorance on full display with posts like Justine Sacco's tweet about AIDS, Africa, and whiteness. The delicious tension between Sacco's initial tweet and landing in South Afri Africa became a meme in and of itself following its pickup and subsequent dragging through Twitter. Following Sacco's firing, a New York Times piece following up on the controversy a few years later illustrates the ways unintended consequences are used as a defense against ignorant, harmful posts. Sacco's statement on the insanity of the comment and making fun of an American bubble becomes a way of claiming an overreaction to the offending post that becomes overkill during a learning process. The same process plays out a few years later with Jared Roth's Facebook post of a picture of a black child at his work that was filled with racist comments by friends and Roth's own response about feral kids leading to a hashtag campaign, his name is Caden, to push back against the negative stereotyping of black children. Roth, in a feature by local media, stated that Caden had been victimized, but that I have been targeted. In both instances, Sacco and Roth would lose their jobs, but the larger story focuses on offenders' punishment and whether or not their firing was justified following the outrage about their posts. Each instance illustrates the ways unintentional acts of racist performances online are minimized due to the appropriate measures taken to hold accountable bad actors. These processes can also play out through counterattacks um, um, <clears throat> Uh, against those that try and hold others accountable through social media in cases like Donglegate. When Adria Richards tweet, uh, tweeted PyCon about jokes regarding dongles overheard during the conference, the officials talked to the offending dongle jokers about the convention's code of conduct, and things moved on from there. However, the public callout led to the firing of the joke teller from their position and a subsequent backlash against Richards for getting them fired. Uh, this backlash would illustrate the future of these unintended encounters when Richards became a target of harassment, death threats, and eventually firing when the company she worked for was DDoS'd by her harassers. The Joker's creation of a toxic environment and Richards' subsequent confrontation through tweet led to both of their firing and Richards' own exposure to the toxic techno culture of programming and, and re reactionary violence in the form of harassment and Richards' firing. It is these material consequences for online actions that has me thinking about how various economies play out online that lead to these types of outcomes. Currently, I see Randy Martin's concept of the financialization of daily life, online interactions through the seepage of boundaries between finance and everyday life that orients us towards accounting and risk management in all domains of life. Um, platform economies that are relying upon content churn and engagement, as well as businesses utilizing those content streams to promote products and services have turned social engagement online into creators of wealth that require disciplinary structures for deviant behavior. Sacco and Roth become liabilities to their employers and are subsequently fired in order to avoid a toxic moniker. These material consequences create an environment where current ideas around cancel culture become a rallying point for decrying any form of criticism as a tax on individuals and in itself a harmful act. This financialization of social life places a cost benefit analysis on every interaction online because of the, extractive, the extraction of economic value from engagement and content. During the summer of 2014, previous consequences for racist misogynist posts become a point of pride and enrichment for the various groups interested in maintaining power through, through white supremacist heteropatriarchy. Gamergate is a nexus for me in understanding the politics of unintention through the ways that proponents of the hate movement justify their involvement with and support of Gamergate. Its origins are based in a revenge blog specifically designed to destroy the life of the writer's ex. The blog took off as a smoking gun that was utilized by various internet misogynists to decry women in the video game industry and cast social justice warriors as villains trying to destroy the male dominated space of video games. What is striking about the evolution of Gamergate is just how quickly it shifted from destroying one person's life to targeting journalists and politics as invading in a political space. Gamergate's greatest accomplishment was in obfuscating its inherent misogyny, um, <clears throat> It's inherent misogyny and racism by attacking the people that critique video games. When supporters joined Gamergate, their reactions to criticism were based in ignorance of its origins and a denial of the responsibility for the misogyny because of their support of apolitical video games. Gamergate also utilized astroturfing campaigns like Not Your Shield to bait critics of the movement into debating the agency of women and people of color while simultaneously drawing in sincere supporters of fighting tokenism. This echoed previous so social media astroturfing campaigns like and, and Father's Day that had bots and sock puppet accounts acting as, a, as women of color that would be fought through the unmasking campaign by black women, your slip is showing. 
While End Father's Day was an MRA trolling campaign, Gamergate's brought to appeal to gamers and its claims to a campaign for ethics and games journalism lent the campaign legitimacy to outside observers to participate. This allowed a cavalcade of grifters like Breitbart, MRA troll, and Pizzagate promoter Mike Cernovic and burgeoning 8chan to utilize the outrage of Gamergate to gain followers, advertising revenue, sell products, and promote fundraising activities to file charges against their enemies. Gamergate produced a template of denying responsibility for the hate and harassment of the movement while claiming victimhood from the critics they were targeting. It was a decoupling of ideology and action via a claim that their intention was to support video games and not the misogyny ingrained in them and those that called them out were in fact the real oppressors. At the same time that Gamergate uh, was forming and gaining steam, a similar dynamic played out around Black Lives Matter during the Ferguson uprising following the killing of Michael Brown. Indeed, during the initial conspiracy stage of Gamergate, one of the key videos laying the groundwork for Gamergate justified gamer outrage by comparing their movement to the unrest in Ferguson. Here, the rise of the counter hashtag All Life Matters begins a full articulation of the privilege of ignorance's previously unarticulated prerogative of power. As Black folks took to the streets and social media to protest the right to dignity and humanity, the All Lives Matter hashtag was an explicit denial of that right through the continued production of ignorance towards the history of violence against Black people that is entwined in the founding principles of the United United States. This articulation of a willful push towards a lack of a need to know would expose moderate allies to the critique of the viewpoint, leading to an insistence on not intending to belittle Black Lives Matter and change, or a deeper retrenchment of their belief that Black lives did not matter on a principle of a myth of contemporary equity of inclusion. In this, we see All Lives Matter growing alongside Blue Lives Matter, conflating a career choice of sanctioned state violence against Black and brown bodies with the right to exist without the threat of everyday violence. Applying the lens of unintention to Blue Lives Matter, I see the privilege of ignorance extended through resistance to accountability programs and police violent data tracking. I see a singular focus towards protecting all officers regardless of their actions and a refusal to hold account or take responsibility for any use of force in the line of duty. This lack of accounting and willful disregard of the lived experience of over-policed communities is a means to maintain power through belligerent ignorance of the history and current role of policing in the United States. Current debates around defunding the police mirror the ways Gamergate and the network of hate groups gain support and funding through claims of victimization at the hands of callouts and critique. It is not the intention of officers to kill unarmed civilians and to critique them could destabilize the safety of our country. Fear and ignorance combined to prop up and enforce the violent arm of the state. These politics played out in late December, 2014, when a grand jury decided not to press charges against officers in the killing of Eric Garner. As the outrage grew, a collective response to the jury's decision by the black community was created through the Alive While Black hashtag. The hashtag detailed the personal experiences of everyday surveillance and policing that black folks faced. As the hashtag trended, white allies began a sister hashtag, hashtag crime and wall white. While the heart may have been in the right place, the crime and wall white hashtag reinforced the privilege of whiteness in everyday encounters with police and became a distraction from the broadcast experiences of everyday police violence that Alive While Black was seeking to highlight. These hashtags create an interesting juxtaposition, but the act of broadcasting white privilege serves as a diluting effect to highlighting over-policing through alive while black. This type of overzealous allyship can have detrimental effects beyond impact as illustrated by Blackout Tuesday's adoption of allies by allies on Instagram that literally silenced Black Lives Matter organizing efforts during the ground on the ground protest actions following the killing of George Floyd. The adoption of Black Squares on Instagram and pairing it with the Black Lives Matter hashtag blocked organizing and information posts that activists had been using to coordinate protest efforts through Instagram. The lack of a need to know about the harm jumping into a viral moment in order to perform allyship can have detrimental effects on the actual work of organizing and change. Um, finally, I'd like to just point out that the last four years have seen these processes accelerate through Donald Trump's Twitter and ever expanding right wing uh, ecosystem that has created permissive and incent permission and incentive structures for belligerently championing the worst forms of white supremacist heteropatriarchy and being unapologetic about the impact and harm of the unintended readings made by critics. The politics of unintended is, unintention is bolstered by the Trump administration's war on knowledge, recently releasing an executive order against implicit bias trainings and acknowledging histories of oppression in the United States. This act is an explicit means of reestablishing hierarchies of power via perceived persecution of white supremacist heteropatriarchy. Its statements um, around the fundamental premise underpinning the Republic that all individuals are created equal is all life matters amplified through the executive branch. These are challenges that we face going into the next decade of exploring online discourse where ignorance is codified through executive action to protect the feelings of those that benefit from the structures of power that supports white supremacist heteropatriarchy and are threatened by the destructive ideology of critical race theory and beyond. In closing, I have a few organizing questions to pose that are at the forefront of my own thinking of politics of unintention. What role does ignorance play in confronting the shame and histories of violence in contemporary social movements like Black Lives Matter and Me Too? And what responsibilities do platforms have in fostering healthy communities beyond providing tools for communication, particularly as extremist ideologies exploit technological art of actors? Thank you.
Thank you, Joseph. Our next presenter is Marianne Gunderson, uh, who is a PhD fellow in digital culture at the University of Bergen. Her research focuses on how machine vision is represented in speculative fiction and digital narrative storytelling practices. Her talk is The Internet of Eyes, Machine Vision in Digital Horror. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, so I'm part of a project on representations of machine vision in art fiction and popular culture. Uh, and I'll be talking about what surveillance and machine vision devices are doing in uh, digital horror. So uh, machine vision and digital surveillance is increasingly a part of our everyday lives and many of us interact with a variety of devices that make use of facial recognition uh, biometric uh, identification digital surveillance video streams etc throughout the day uh, and in the media uh, these developments are often commented upon with fear or anxiety sometimes framed in dystopian terms um, drawing on, on fears of totalitarian surveillance states, uh, and sometimes in terms of personal victimization by my malicious agents. So I'm interested in um, these expressions of fear and anxiety, not because they are surprising or in any way unreasonable, but because I think they may be able to tell us something about our relationship with these technologies. So uh, my aim was therefore to investigate how these devices are presented in genres that deal directly with, with fear and horror. Uh, and for this purpose, I've been researching um, the digital ho horror genre, popularly called creepypasta. Uh, originally a pun on copypasta, creepypasta got popularized through 4 chance random and paranormal boards. Uh, where people would copy and paste anonymously authored stories from thread to thread. Uh, and uh, these, these kinds of stories have since spread throughout the internet. Uh, and as a kind of digital folklore, these stories are written by and for multiple online communities out of the shared desire to, to scare and be scared. Um, so while some genres like literary, fic literary fiction often omits uh, references to technology that would make a text feel dated. Creepypasta is written to tap into what people are afraid of right now, uh, and it often embraces the horror of contemporary technology. So many of the stories are populated by existing or imagined devices, uh, such as web cameras, uh, facial recognition apps, home security systems, uh, AI assistants, and baby monitors. So the stories I've been analyzing for this project come from uh, the No Sleep subreddit, uh, which is a horror fiction community on Reddit with, uh, at the moment, more than 14 million users. So um, we've also been doing some quantitative research on the forum and found that even if we exclude stories that mention only camera or photography, uh, over time, uh, between four and 7% of the stories posted to the board mention some sort of surveillance or machine vision device uh, in their stories, which may not seem that, that much, like that much, but uh, it left us, when we were researching this, it left us with more than 23,000 different posts and, and uh, the kind of, the, the the tendency is increasing. There's more and more, higher and higher proportion of the stories that, that deal with these devices. Uh, but in this talk, I'm presenting the qualitative part of this research based on close readings of a selection of stories in which machine vision or surveillance devices play an active part of the horror. So uh, while these stories are written to be scary, uh, what I'm wondering is, what kind of fears are connected to these devices? How do these technologies figure in digital horrors? Uh, and um, 
how are devices such as webcams, smartphones, baby monitors, and smart home devices used in, in this kind of folkloric fiction uh, to produce horror? And what could that potentially say about our fears and anxieties about machine vision and surveillance technologies? So uh, I'll be highlighting in, in this talk, I'll be highlighting um, three um, themes or tendencies that I, that I find to be kind of commonly repeated. Uh, and uh, I'll be, uh, uh, yeah. And the first of these themes that I'll be looking at is uh, the role um, of technology in mediating our access to reality. So this comes up in stories like your camera has detected motion. Um, I saw something weird behind me on Skype or my camera knows something I don't. So in these stories, um, the devices reveal something that the narrators are not able to detect with their bare eyes. Uh, I'm not able to go into detail with, uh, in all of them, but for instance, in, for instance, a Skype video reveals something coming out of a crack in the wall behind uh, the per a person chatting with their girlfriend. Uh, and uh, in my camera knows something I don't, uh, a camera with a face seeking focus mechanism keep automatically focusing on faces that don't exist, but these faces seem to be coming closer. Um, so the ideas of cam the idea of cameras or other devices detecting something from from the beyond uh, is not new. It can be traced back to, for instance, spirit, spirit photography in the 19th century, which um, Tom Gunning has argued are expressions of the inherent un uncanniness of, phot of photography's ability to create um, images with no reference. So. Um, and these horror stories seem to take advantage uh, of this and play it against the association between the technical uh, and scientific and, ob and objective fact. So um, Lena Henriksen, who did her PhD on creepypasta, uh, has argued that um, the camera as a supposedly objective and scientific instrument plays a crucial role in the production of horror and the monsters. So imaging technologies used to capture and disprove the existence of the supernatural uh, can also become the medium through which the supernatural can be summoned. Uh, or in Henriksen's word, uh, te words, technology seems to produce what it is otherwise supposed to dismiss. So by providing conflicting images of what's really there, um, these technologies used to separate fact from fiction become the site of the haunting. So in the stories I've been, been reading here or analyzing, the, uh, when the devices reveal objects or beings that conflict with the narrator's own senses, uh, it not, not only destabilizes their sense of reality, it also introduces the horror of knowing that either the narrator's own sense of uh, the, the narrator's own senses are deceiving them, and they are sharing their space with something or someone unknown to them, or the devices that are supposed to show objective representations of what is really there are actually more lively and active than presumed, and are doing something completely different. So uh, the next set of stories I want to talk about takes this one step further introducing devices that are actively participating in interpreting reality and creating meanings or narratives that are off-putting and distressing. So this is the case in my Fitbit thinks I'm dead, or I created an AI to make procedurally generated movies, but they're horrifying. Uh, or has anyone else used expressioncaptioner.com? So the first two should be self-explanatory, but in the last one, the narrator shares his experience with what he thought was a funny interactive meme site that used emotion recognition to creatively add captions to selfies uploaded by its users. Uh, but after a while, the captions he, he received became increasingly distressing and ultimately threatening, indicating that something awful would happen to the narrator in the near future. 
So there's also, uh, I'd also thought I'd include a recent example from Twitter. Um, if you can't read the caption, um, the square in the doorway is captioned with age 250, 253, mood angry and gender unknown. So in these works, um, algorithm, alg algorithmically enhanced imaging technologies are mobilized to produce horror um, through their ability to seemingly independently interpret reality differently than what we do. Um, in her book, um, Unthought, N.K. Hales uh, argues that technologies are taking on an increasingly active role as, an interpreter, as interpreters and creators of meaning and are capable of what she terms as non-conscious cognition. So non-conscious cognition includes the sensory processing and attention management that our brains do without our, con without our conscious notice or intervention, uh, as well as the movements and adaptations made by, for instance, plants and other organ organisms, and the meaning-making decisions involved in algorithmic systems. So according to Hales, cognition is much broader than human thinking, uh, and the search for meaning is a pervasive activity between humans, animals, and technical devices. So that means that we're already thinking within and as a part of technical systems, and that the resulting meanings are no, no longer necessarily our own. In these stories, the technical devices serve as the site of contact between human and non-human cognition, as a site of co-cognition. Co uh, but what these stories make explicit is that this co-cognition does not always go smoothly. It can be antagonistic, uncomfortable, or even scary. They read our faces, but we don't recognize or don't like how, see, how they see us. So they meet, the meanings they provide us with are not our own, uh, or they don't serve our purpose. The third theme uh, I'd like to highlight is uh, uh, deals with the issue of redistribution of agency between humans and technical agents. So here we have stories like um, the Smart House Massacre, and AI has been finding missing bodies and we relied on it. Uh, and a story titled, You'll Never Even Know, uh, in which the narrator discovers that uh, and I quote, all the overlapping connected layers of observation uh, that are produced by devices that they surround themselves with, such as phones, smart TVs, gaming consoles, kitchen devices, home security systems, they all link together to become something more, like an, some kind of nebulous entity that uses this pervasive presence to subtly sabotage people's lives. So, um, in these stories, they play on, on the commonly imagined fear that technology will take over and seek to kill us or sabotage us, which is frequently referenced in other media as well. So while this usually involves, uh, or stories that, that take up this topic usually involve uh, some kind of advanced uh, artificial intelligence, it often, at least in the story stories that I've been reading for this project, it also includes uh, an element of surveillance or machine vision. Uh, in these stories, the horror manifests as the result of, of agency distributed, what, uh, distributed through what Jane Bennett would call an assemblage of technical devices. Uh, and the threat derived, is derived from the depth and extent of these, these um, technologies involvement in our lives. So in her analysis of a major electricity blackout in the US, Jane Bennett argues that human-machine interactions, especially in complex systems, must be understood in terms of distributed agency, where there is not, not so much a doer behind the deed as a doing and an affecting by a human-non-human -human assemblage. So uh, what she su suggests is that the source of what unfolds cannot necessarily be found in individual in intentions or actions. Uh, and uh, in expanding, and instead of um, expanding our own agency with their ability to record and represent and predict, in these stories, the devices extend their own or other agencies into our li lives 
undermining our sense of individual autonomy and agency. So uh, to sum up, uh, the horror of machine vision as it, ex it is expressed in uh, these creepypasta stories uh, derive or come from either the technological mediation uh, of vision undermining a sense of reality uh, or um, the contested meaning making and antagonistic co-cognition between humans and technical devices or redistribution of agency between humans and technical agents. So. Uh, just uh, in closing, I just want to uh, call attention to the things that are not expressed as fair in these stories, such as um, state or corporate large-scale large surveillance, uh, surveillance used against, against minoritized or racialized groups or bias. So I'm, um, this may per per possibly be explained by traits inherent in the genre of folkloristic horror which tend to be relatively apolitical and drawn on established sets of tropes, or it's another potential explanation, and this is only speculation on my side, uh, could be that these stories serve to contain or dispel our disease or discomfort with these technologies. So by giving them a supernatural wrapping that can easily be disbelieved, these stories allow us to entertain and be entertained by our fear if these uh, devices, machine vision and surveillance, without having to deal with the use of the, these technologies in real contexts of oppression and harm. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. So um, before we get into the q and I would like to ask if any of the panelists have any questions for one another. Sorry, can I can I jump in or? <laughs> Go ahead. No. Yeah, um, I mean, I think what's what what's what's striking to me about all three of our our presentations is how there's there's a sort of like through line of affect um, going through all of these things, and it's like I didn't explicitly name it. I didn't explicitly name it in my uh, conversation um, in, in my presentation because it, I'm more thinking through like unintention and these these postings as these sort of like visceral reactions of white supremacy right um and and it's this act effective embodiment that goes through that but you know i, I guess i would just like to uh hear my fellow panelists like just you know talk about like like these affective dimensions of surveillance um whether you know through um the the horror and and the horror of creepypasta or this sort of like the state surveillance um and uh sort of like was it necropolitics of 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 that that surveillance and and just like how how that plays into your understanding of sort of like everyday um, experiences with these technologies of surveillance? I guess that's something that just I'm always interested in affect, um, so it's always exciting. Yeah, I think um, for me um, it was really important in my research to constantly remind myself that surveillance is not just limited to this. Gener like this generation or like this, the time, the present time we're in. And surveillance isn't limited only by like the technologies. Um, so surveillance has been around, you know, it's a, it's a fundamental paradigm of like any colonial or settler colonial society. And um, I guess where the, the affective part comes in is like, we are constantly, you know, surveilling ourselves, obviously like um, this idea of the panopticon, you know, we, we live in a panopticon where like surveillance doesn't necessarily need advanced technology to function. It, it just needs power. And, um, and I think in, in terms of that, like, I, I believe that like surveillance is really embodied in under, under such a state and that inherent distrust that capitalism breeds um, really is where like surveillance grows the best, I think. Uh, yeah, it was um, it was really important to me to 
to include affect in my work with this project because I think I think affect and emotion is, is actually a huge part of of how we think and process things. Uh, so it will color what we think about things, but it will also color what we don't think about when we think about things. Um, and um, I also think that that uh, part of what drew me to Creepypasta and um, this kind of digital vernacular creativity specifically is that, um, that these genres that are uh, created in uh, online communities often kind of for the pleasure of other readers or uh, viewers in the community uh, have this ability to bring out effective aspects of um, of what they're dealing with uh, because they're kind of made to appeal to the emotions they're made to be engaging uh, and not in a commercially packaged way but in a way that that is kind of feeding into this communal activity. I actually have a question for Priya. Uh, so Priya, do you see uh, any fundamental differences uh, in the way that surveillance technologies are developed and deployed in India as compared to uh, the United States? That is, uh, Adar seems to have some fundamental political and social uh, distinctions from something like um, the United States domain awareness systems or other uh, state implemented surveillance technologies. Uh, so I wonder if you could uh, speak to some of the distinctions you, you see in uh, the ways that these, these surveillance technologies are taken up by state actors um, across uh, borders. Yeah, so I think what's very unique about Adan in India is that just the sheer scale of to, of deploying a biometric identification system to 1.2 billion people. I think, you know, it, that is the largest biometric surveillance system in the world. And it's, it really exemplifies um, the ways in which, you know, like India, um, India's neoliberalism is, is bolstering to an effect where it can successfully, you know, intertwine itself with ethno-nationalism. And I think that, form of ethno-nationalism is, is um, really pernicious when, when you know, uh, put upon a biometric identifier because um, this idea that biometrics is a neutral form of identification is very misguided. And it's, it's almost like the propaganda that the government wants us to believe that like, there's no way we can, you know, cut out corruption and fraud without using biometrics. So I think, India is very unique in the way that the Modi government has um, taken Aadhaar up, you know, uh, and has successfully championed Aadhaar as a as a identification system and the ways it's been linked to, you know, every public institution you can think of. And I think, you know, that's, it's very distinct from, I think, the U.S. because I think the U.S. obviously also perpetrates mass surveillance in, in terms of like phone tapping and, and um, interception which India does as well, but I think the scale to which India has championed biometric surveillance is um, is is what the U.S. will 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 want to learn from as they as they you know amp up their surveillance. Thank you. Um, so. In light of all three of your talks, uh, what question about your research do you want uh, do you want most to be asked? Yeah, I think for me, um, I mean, anyone can feel free to jump in. But I think you know, with the pandemic and with contact tracing as something that uh, countries are implementing um, upon the background of such a, you know, um, violent surveillance system. I'm really curious about the ways in which these structures of surveillance um, 
the way they foreground what what we'll see coming and what we have already seen in terms of um, you know the punitive measures that people are being in, uh, impacted by by you know like being out on the street or breaking curfew or um, you know not wearing masks and and the ways in which like contact tracing if it's um, embedded into such a violent surveillance system just the implications that that will have and the ex excuses that um, countries will make to surveil their citizens more. So I'm really interested in the COVID question of surveillance and uh, how this my work can be applied to to that, you know, as we see that in the years to come. I'll go. Um, you know, I think I think uh, probably the the one question that I would like to get about my research um, in this field is actually like a question that I have, and it, and it's and it's about how we hold uh, people responsible for the things that they post online, and not and it's a weird it's something that's always like bugged me about like doing research on like GamerGate, right, where there's these obvious through lines about um, where certain movements started and how they're based in particular forms of violence and oppression. And yet folks continually, you know, disagree with critique and, and pointing out that, hey, you're probably, you probably don't want to use this hashtag because it's super toxic and terrible, right? And so, you know, especially like that last four years uh, slide on my presentation, like my, my concluding slide, I struggled because it's like, you could just take, you could do a day in the life of a of a tweet by Donald Trump and take the last four years and just go forever looking at the ways that they, that he sort of like has obfuscated responsibility for anything he posts. Um, and the same goes for a lot of these sort of like cancel culture critics that are, you know, decrying the sort of victimhood that they're suffering by actually being held responsible for enactments of privilege that have been around, you know, well before you know, social media, right? And so, I mean, I think I think that's a question that that I'm that I'm grappling with in sort of like exploring this is what it means to actually take responsibility for the things that we're saying in this information age, where you know it seems like things that are off the top of your head aren't necessarily uh, fair game, um, which has always been the history of sort of like microaggressions and oppression in the United States and abroad, right? And so it's like thinking through these, these ideas uh, is something that, that's a question that I'm excited about, I guess. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like I have a bunch of questions that are kind of fighting for space in my head right now. And several of them are kind of specifically the questions I don't want to be asked. <laughs> um, because um, I feel like uh, it is, for instance, about why there, why these stories that are written to be horrifying seem to, um, yeah, ignore all the all the kind of real visceral harms that are being done with these technologies. This is a question I would, I at the moment don't really know how to answer, except for with speculation, which I kind of touched on at the end of my presentation, but I would um, I would love to think further with that and think further with what uh, what what this what it means uh, that these things are omitted without kind of um, a kind of um, belittling or or uh, Without, while still taking the content of these stories seriously and deal with them as potential expressions of real fears or that these fears can still be expressing something essential while be ignoring this kind of um, huge pile of other issues. Um, yeah. Uh, on that note, Marianne, I have a question uh, regarding the connections of your research into or creepypasta with other uh, forms of popular entertainment. So in the late 
to or in the late 90s early aughts there were several movies that kind of emulated this kind of copy or uh, creepypasta affect and i'm thinking specifically of uh pulse the remake of cairo which had a similar kind of uh orientation towards creepypasta insofar as supernatural entities were invading the world vis-a-vis -vis our technological connections. So insofar as creepypasta seems to be a internet uh, move or an internet driven af uh, affective form to address these concerns with uh, surveillance and technology, do you see a continuity with other kinds of media that address these, these kinds of anxieties vis-a-vis uh, horror or um, other kinds of, say, frightening narratives? Uh, yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's definitely continuity. Uh, and while I haven't seen um, that movie in particular, like Creepypasta as a genre, uh, draws on, on just a bunch of very common horror tropes in a lot of what it does. Uh, and, and I also want to specify that while uh, a, a kind of significant chunk of creepypasta does this um, or do feature these technologies and they, and, and they can play a really active role in creating or setting the stage for the horror uh, when uh, in the kind of quantitative analysis of the, of the forum, it was still, uh, if we included camera and photography up to 10% of the story. So it's not the main, necessarily the main concern of the stories, uh, but, uh, but it is still remarkable like how often this topic comes up. Um, and I think it also does some things that, that you can also see in horror movies, which where you talked about this kind of where the technology or these screens become this kind of portal through which other things can, can access us, can kind of harm us. So uh, you, could, you could kind of um, see parallels with, uh, was it The Ring? Uh, yeah, uh, where seeing something, uh, even if you feel like you're, it's normally a one-way screen, suddenly this seeing something means you get seen. So the kind of, the act of seeing suddenly uh, becomes this thing that involves you, uh, and the 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 thing where uh, where by seeing something you become vulnerable to being seen and to kind of be um, accessed or uh, interacted with through, by these agencies that can kind of use the technology uh, against you. Uh, so so I feel like there there is like um, a, a kind of a, thematic matter uh, and and these kind of interconnected tropes that are that come up in in horror movies in creepypasta in uh, probably other kind of horror genres as well uh, but I find like creepypasta is, is incredibly productive to study this because there's just so much of it constantly being produced uh, and they keep trying to find a new angle on things. Joseph, I have uh, one final question for you. Um, your presentation seemed to focus on individuals showing their asses on the internet. Um, does your work expand your analysis to include the ways that institutions, corporations, um, other collective bodies uh, seem to sh also show their asses on the internet? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, I think. I think what's really interesting um, from trying to like <laughs> select a, a corpus of ass showing for, for a 15 minute presentation, basically, um, it's trying to find um, specific uh, moments of, of these ruptures where they sort of like are evolving. But I mean, like if, if I'm just going back to like the Gamergate um, uh, controversy, like there was a whole point where uh, there was a campaign to get um, advertisers to boycott um, specific journalism website, game journalism websites. And there's, um, there's a, 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 a screen grab of one tweet from Adobe where they were, where some account said, hey, do you support bullies? Um, because this website has 
uh, information and Adobe responded saying, we don't support bullying of any type and we don't advertise on that platform. And then it turned around into their, they're stepping into this, this war zone basically where they ended up uh, raising a bunch of money to contribute to um, developing um, uh, programs for women in, in technology and things like that because they realized that their, their, their initial siding with Gamergate as against bullying becomes this bigger issue, right? And you see that especially this, this last year um, with the Black Lives Matter protests um, and the sort of like extreme corporate response to Black Lives Matter. Um, I mean, going back to Andre Brock's work, um, I follow him on Twitter and he was retweeting all these like this you memes um, with all these corporate statements that looks at like where they're talking about valuing Black lives, but there's so many times where they've either had issues where they fired um, people of color or have been, you know, like misogynist workplaces and things like that. So, you know, there's there's definitely spaces for exploring these institutional um, ass showing um, that occurs uh, throughout throughout moments in the last decade and have are entirely happening now too. I mean, like even the um, even the blackout Instagram uh, sort of like meme started out as you know the music industry um, and black black musicians specifically supporting the protest through through blacking out their output for the day as as part of an anti capitalist um, boycott, right? Whereas and then it just gets adopted by everybody who just floods the the, the platform with. With darkness basically right so so i mean those are those are those type of things where you know good intentions can also become these these moments of um uh, affect i guess <laughs> but i mean you know like they, they 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 do they do create um unintended outcomes right um so yeah thank you joseph and on that note, I'd like to thank our presenters, Priya, Marianne, and Joseph for your talks. And we will see you in 2021.